Now on to today's webinar, Factors Associated with Community Ambulation in Older Adults and Those with Stroke and Osteoarthritis. I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Ruth Barkley. She's an associate professor in the Department of Physical Therapy, College of Rehab Sciences at the Raddy Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Manitoba. A uh, main focus of her research is community ambulation of older adults and people with stroke. She is currently co-principal investigator of a CIHR-funded multi-site randomized controlled trial evaluating two interventions to improve outdoor walking for older adults. So with, uh, with that, I will pass the ball on to uh, Dr. Barclay. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I would like to uh, acknowledge my co-investigators, Sandra Weber and Jackie Ricott and Robert Tate. So uh, first, I wanted to talk about why uh, walking in the community is important. Um, and so I wanted to uh, show you a few slides of, of pictures that were taken by participants in a, in a study that we conducted a few years ago with Photo Voice, where people with stroke took pictures and described what participation in the community meant to them. So as an intro, I'll show you three of the pictures that focused on walking in the community and then why we wanted to focus on community ambulation in future studies. So the first one here, um, this gentleman took a picture from the inside of his apartment looking out into the community. And he said, walking around the living room isn't going to cut it. The pictures of the outside, that is the world I have to get back into. So he was stressing his wish to be able to walk outside in the community. Another person in the study took this photo of this long straight sidewalk. Uh, which is, you know, Winnipeg sidewalks isn't all that common. Usually they're, they're cracked and broken. But um, he said, walking is difficult. And I was trying to use this to represent the problems. So he was really focusing on the challenge of being able to walk that distance. He said, that looks like a really long sidewalk. It's really difficult to walk that distance. So he was really addressing the issue of endurance and being able to walk far enough for a particular walking task. This other uh, picture was taken by a person in the study who said, uh, nature picture represents our walks around the block. Nature is everywhere, even a walk down a side street. Uh, and, and we have found looking at, at the literature that there is literature regarding walking outdoors and in nature that has suggested positive benefits for both mental and physical health uh, with outdoor walking. So, um, when we're looking at community ambulation, what we're referring to is walking outside of the home in the community. So that could uh, include walking both indoors and outdoors as long as it's outside of an individual's home. So for example, walking at a friend's house, walking outdoors uh, in a park, walking in a shopping mall. And the purpose for walking um, could vary uh, greatly from person to person. It could be for exercise, for transportation, to walk to a place or to get to the bus could be walking for errands or, or uh, to a social activity or uh, for the purpose of a social activity. So for the purpose of today's presentation, I may use the term community ambulation or walking outside or walking outdoors synonymously because this, in this particular presentation, we are talking about community ambulation that is specifically out, outside of the house outdoors. Uh, so other literature um, has shown that in older adults, limited community ambulation has been associated with uh, mobility decline and self-care decline, also with decreased health-related quality of life, uh, with social isolation, uh, sorry, <laughs> social isolation, and uh, it is considered a, a marker of frailty. People who are ambulating in the community, that's found to be associated with a lower risk of mortality and higher self-rated health. And um, this concept of self-rated health you will see uh, coming up in, in, in this presentation as we go along. The objective of this study is to identify factors associated with community ambulation in Canadian adults aged 45 to 85, those with stroke, and those with osteoarthritis. We use the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. Uh, we use the baseline 
tracking data set version 3.2. We use data from the tracking main wave and from the maintaining contact questionnaire. Uh, so we were looking at, at um, over 18,000, almost 19,000 people. So just a few definitions because we did look specifically at people with stroke and people with osteoarthritis. So if uh, people answered yes to any of the following questions, we included them as, as in our definition of, of someone who had had a stroke. So there are questions that is, has your doctor ever told you that you've experienced a stroke or a CVA? Uh, has the doctor ever told you you've experienced a mini stroke or TIA? Or if you suffer from the effects of the stroke, CVA, mini stroke, or TIA? So if a person answered yes to any of those questions, they were defined in our stroke group. And then for people with osteoarthritis, uh, because we were focusing on community ambulation, we focused on osteoarthritis in the lower extremity. So if people answered yes to, has the doctor ever told you that you have osteoarthritis in the knee or osteoarthritis in the hip, then they were included in our definition of people with osteoarthritis. The outcome uh, that we were looking at, again, is community ambulation, and there's a question. Uh, in the CLSA, which is over the last seven days, how often did you take a walk outside your home or yard for any reason? For example, for pleasure or exercise, walking to work, walking the dog, etc. And the responses of that, there's four of them, and they're never, seldom, sometimes, or often. So we dichotomized uh, this outcome to sometimes or often versus never or seldom. The explanatory variables that, uh, that we used in the study were chosen based on the published literature. So we included the following, self-rated health, uh, depression, number of chronic conditions, the ability to walk independently, so without help, uh, being able to walk two to three blocks, really um, reflecting endurance, um, the ability to stand up from a chair, uh, pain, number of falls in the previous year, the month of interview, which uh, we felt reflected the weather, uh, also age and sex. Control variables, uh, we were looking at province, income, education, marital status, and whether the person lived in an urban or rural setting. For our models, uh, what we did was, uh, for all models, we used univariate binary logistic regression with community ambulation as the outcome and each explanatory variable individually. Uh, all variables were statistically significant. Uh, so all variables were, were added to the multivariable binary logistic regression model. So for older adults, for people with stroke and people with osteoarthritis, we did models of all ages. We did a model for male, model for females. And then for the older adult group, uh, we also did models for the various age categories that you see there on the slide. Uh, for weighting, uh, if we used, if we did weighted frequencies, we used trimmed weights, and for the modeling, we used analytic weights. So looking at, at some of the characteristics of the all ages groups, so the ages 45 to 85, uh, the mean age was 60.5, and uh, just picked out a few things just to give you an idea of, of this group. Uh, people that walk, describe themselves as walking outside the home never or seldom in the past week, um, that was 34%. 51% uh, were female. 3% uh, had two or more falls in the last 12 months. And we chose to look at two or more falls because uh, people are at a higher risk for, for future falls. And we looked at number of chronic conditions. So the number of people who had seven or more chronic conditions uh, was at 18%. So when we look at this slide, these are um, the variables or factors um, that were associated with being less likely to walk outside sometimes or often versus never or seldom. So if uh, self-rated health was lower relative to being excellent, so poor, fair, good, or very good, people were less likely to walk outside sometimes or often. 
If people were unable to or had difficulty walking two to three blocks, they were also less likely to walk outside. And I just want to point out that, the, uh, again, the walking two to three blocks uh, represents endurance. Uh, unable doesn't mean that a person can't walk at all. It does refer to the inability to walk the distance of two to three blocks. That's too far to walk. Uh, be also uh, being female, you're less likely to walk outside. And then if a person had severe pain or moderate pain versus being pain-free, less likely to walk outside as well. So looking at the factors related to being more likely to walk outside, certainly we found in general the younger age categories, people were more likely to walk outside than people in the older age category. And then in, in months that, that tend to be uh, better weather, uh, people appear to be more likely to walk relative to January. When we looked at the age categories separately, uh, sorry, when we looked at, uh, not age, at gender, uh, sex, females versus males, um, if in females, uh, they were less likely to walk if they had decreased self-rated health related to excellent, if they had severe or moderate pain, and then also if they had um, difficulty or when were unable to walk two to three blocks in that age. Uh, more likely to walk outside in the younger age categories and, and in, uh, in months where the uh, better weather. Uh, males were less likely to walk outside, very similar to the females. Um, and for the reasons of more likely to walk outside, the 65 to 74 year age group uh, people were more likely to walk outside than the older age group, also the weather, uh, but then in addition of um, chronic conditions. So males that had a lower number of chronic conditions relative to seven or more were more likely to walk outside. We also uh, further looked at age uh, categories, and you can see there are um, a number of of similarities across the age categories, some things that are common, also some differences. Um, when um, we, we look across, we see self-rated health is relatively common, except for one category, um, and that, that endurance or being able to walk that distance of two to three blocks is common across the age group, as well as the issue of, of pain, um, people with with uh, severe or moderate pain being less likely to walk outdoors in the three lower age categories. In the, so some interesting things to note in the 65 to 74 year age group, people were more likely to walk outside. Again, if they had this decreased number of chronic conditions relative to having seven or more. In the age 75 to 85 category, uh, difficulty or inability to stand up independently was associated with being less likely to walk outdoors and that the, being able to stand up um, independently is a, is a reflection of leg strength. So you could possibly interpret that as, as having decreased leg strength. People would be less likely to walk um, outside. Um, for the age uh, group of 45 to 54, being sometimes depressed uh, versus being rarely depressed was also associated with being less likely to, to walk outdoors. And we see that uh, females were less likely to walk uh, outdoors in the uh, two older age categories. When we look at, uh, move to the stroke, uh, model of people with stroke and look at some of the characteristics there, we had a, a smaller number of people, of course, that we were looking at. So there was 866 people um, in this model. Um, and the mean age was a bit older at 68.3. And so here I've got some of the same um, characteristics describing the population. And in brackets in red, you can see that comparison to the, the whole group of the age 45 to 85. So 41% of people describe themselves as walking outside the home never saw them in the past week. 45% were female. 8% described two or more falls in the last 12 months. And 43% of people uh, had seven or more chronic conditions. And we counted those not including the um, definition of stroke that we used. 
So uh, for people with stroke, we found that people were less likely to walk outside, sometimes or often, versus never or seldom, if they were unable or had difficulty walking two or three blocks. So that we see is consistent with the, the other uh, model that we've looked at. And then um, people were uh, more likely to walk outside sometimes uh, or often if they were in the 55 to 64 year age group versus the older age group. Um, and then mild, having mild pain versus pain free. So we're going to talk a bit about why this might be. Um, and then also uh, looking at the months, so reflecting the weather. So you can see in the, the sort of better weather months that people would be more likely to walk outside. When we looked at uh, people with stroke and looking at males and females separately, uh, we see similarities in less likely to walk outdoors. We'll begin that endurance or ability to walk two to three blocks. Uh, for men, we also see that uh, being sometimes depressed versus rarely depressed, uh, men were less likely to walk outdoors. And then when you look at reasons for being uh, for factors associated with being more likely to walk outside. Uh, again, we see that 55 to 64 year age group in women more likely to walk outdoors than the oldest group. Uh, also the better weather months. Um, but those we don't see in the, in the male group. Um, and then we see the more likely to walk with keep pain in, in both age groups, <clears throat> which again, we didn't really expect to see. When we look at uh, people with Osteoarthritis, uh, we have a, a larger group than stroke. So we had uh, just over, well, over 3,800 people, almost 3,900. Uh, and the mean age was 64.5, so similar to the overall age group, or more similar. Uh, walking outside, 38% described walking outdoors, sold them or never in the last week. 60% were female. 5% of people described. Well, uh, two or more falls in the last 12 months, and 30% of people uh, described having uh, seven or more um, chronic health conditions, not including osteoarthritis. So when we look at some of the reasons for being less likely to walk outdoors, we see, again, some similarities with the full um, model of all age groups. Uh, we see self-rated health again which we didn't see with the stroke group. Uh, so poor self-rated health versus excellent or good self-rated health, people were less likely to walk outside, sometimes or often. Um, also, again, we see this endurance walking two to three blocks. Uh, we see pain uh, limiting perhaps outdoor walking and then uh, females less likely to walk outside. sometimes or often. And then looking at some of the reasons for being more likely to walk outdoors. Again, we see younger age groups. Here again, we see a um, number of chronic conditions, so a lower number versus a higher number of people being more likely to walk outdoors, and again, the, uh, in general, uh, better weather months. Uh, for the osteoarthritis group, we also looked at females and males separately, and with females, they were uh, less likely to walk outside and more likely to walk outside for reasons similar to the whole group of people with, with osteoarthritis. And for males, interestingly, quite different. The only um, variables that are factors that were associated with the outdoor walking with community ambulation was a decreased number of chronic conditions for being more likely to walk outside. So I'll just show you a summary across all the different groups for the full models uh, of people of all ages and, and both sexes. Uh, so we have the, the older adult, the osteoarthritis, and the stroke groups. And you can see that self-rated health um, is associated with being less likely to walk outside for both the older adults and people with osteoarthritis. The so walking two to three blocks are endurance consistent across all groups. Um, for sex, females were less likely to walk outdoors in the older adults and osteoarthritis groups. Didn't uh, come up in the stroke group. Um, and then uh, pain for the older adults and osteoarthritis group came up as, as uh, being related to um, less likely to walk outside. Or again, looking at more likely to walk outside, um, we see 
some similarity across groups related to a younger age group um, relative to the oldest age group. And then um, some differences among months, but all uh, uh, better weather months. We see in stroke July and August aren't there. We have had people told us that sometimes it's too hot to walk in those months. So whether that's a factor or not, um, possible. But generally, um, walking outdoors um, is more likely associated with um, better weather months. And then again, this, what we hadn't expected was seeing uh, mild pain uh, being associated with more likely to walk outside in people with stroke. And a uh, number of chronic conditions uh, came up in the osteoarthritis group. So a lower number of chronic conditions relative to a higher number of people were more likely to walk outdoors away. So looking at overall some of the uh, limitations in, in the study, uh, we don't know the type and location of pain. Uh, so that was, that's one thing that we'd like to know more about. Uh, we didn't use the physical test data because we were using the, the tracking data. Uh, and also, it's, it's not a causal model. Uh, you can say that the factors are associated, but not that one causes another. What we did find interesting was that in none of the models um, did we find number of falls in the last year being associated with the frequency of walking outdoors, which we had expected that we might see. Uh, as you saw, there were certainly uh, differences between the models of male and female in, um, in the different models and, and also among the, the ages as well in each category. So for example, uh, women were less likely to walk outside in the 65 to 74 and 75 to 85 year age groups. So looking at um, um, again, thinking about the factors associated with being less likely to walk outdoors. Again, that limited walking endurance seems to be common across all models. It came up in all models except for males with OA. That was the only exception. So certainly that endurance or difficulty or an inability to walk two to three blocks would limit people in, in being walked outside or is associated with uh, less likely to walk outdoors. Uh, also being less likely to walk outdoors is associated with mild to severe pain um, in the all age group and in females with, with osteoarthritis. Lower self-rated health we saw in um, the osteoarthritis model and the, in the all ages model, but when we looked separately at sexes, we saw it only in the females with osteoarthritis model. Um, but that, so that was common across the groups, except for a stroke that didn't appear in people with stroke. Um, being female um, was associated with being less likely to walk outside again in the all age model and, and people with OA. And then we saw in some models being depressed sometimes um, versus being rarely depressed, um, maybe less likely to walk outside. And we saw that in males with stroke and in adults in the younger age group. Uh, so then summarizing, again, looking at factors being associated with being more likely to walk outside. Uh, again, the, the younger age groups we saw in all of the uh, uh, full models. Uh, we saw the, again, the, the mild to moderate pain in people with stroke being associated with being more likely to walk outside, uh, which seems sort of backwards or opposite to what we might have expected. Um, so. You know, we've been thinking about this a bit, and we know that we, we don't know the location or the cause of pain. Uh, we know that sometimes people with stroke may have hemiplegic shoulder pain, which probably in most cases uh, would not be likely to cause decreased walking. Um, and then also a question of were people purposefully walking for, uh, for exercise, because we know that a number of people with, with stroke do uh, walk for exercise. So, um, that doesn't really explain it, but it brings us a few more questions. <laughs> so uh, certainly something that we could further investigate in the future. Um, we saw that it was it was common across all models except for males with osteoarthritis and males with stroke um, that people uh, 
it was associated to be uh, more likely to walk outside in good weather months, um, which certainly makes sense in the, the weather that we have um, in Canada and from some other um, research that has, has been done across Canada and other countries. And then we saw that um, having a lower number of chronic conditions was associated with being more likely to walk um, outdoors in, in males um, of all ages, in males with cluster arthritis, and in the 65 to 74 year age group. So we're always um, trying to think of what potential clinical applications could be to to our work as, as physiotherapists and occupational therapists. And certainly we know that, that pain and um, walking endurance are factors which are amenable to improvement with rehab intervention. So we may uh, assume or think that uh, being able to decrease pain um, and improve walking endurance, uh, people might then be more likely to, to walk out, outdoors for exercise or for, for leisure activities and for transportation in the future. Um, clinically, we know that addressing um, walking endurance may assist people, again, in community ambulation um, for all, all groups. And the other thing that we want to consider for future uh, potential application is that safe locations and strategies for walking in poor weather months should be addressed. So if people aren't walking um, outdoors in poor weather months, or are they not walking outdoors at all, or are there other locations that people can walk if they choose to walk for, for exercise and leisure, um, other places that people can walk, other strategies to maintain mobility over, over winter time. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, looking at next steps for future research, uh, we are going to be taking this a step further. We're going to be repeating some of the analysis that we have done using the comprehensive data set, so using um, some of the, the physical measures and related to, to strength and walking and gait speed, et cetera. And um, we will also be testing existing models of community ambulation. So the one on the left is a model of uh, community ambulation in, uh, for people with stroke. We're going to be um, testing that model using the comprehensive data. And the model on the right is a model of community mobility for older adults. And we're also going to be testing um, that with the comprehensive data using uh, structural occlusion model. So that is our, our, next, our next step in our research. And I would like to acknowledge that this study was funded by the Endowment Fund of the College of Rehabilitation Sciences at the University of Manitoba. I'd like to thank Scott Nowicki, our data analyst, as well. Great. Well, thank you for the excellent presentation. I, I know I learned a lot. Um, the, and now I'd like to open it up to any questions. Just a reminder that re muting will remain on. But you can enter your questions into the chat box in the bottom right corner at end of the WebEx window at any time. Um, I don't think anyone's posted any questions yet, but so maybe I'll start off by um, one of my, it's funny, as I always, I tend to sort of drop questions down and as presentations go, they usually get answered, um, which is, a, I guess, a good sign that I'm asking the right questions and you're answering, answering what people would want to know. Um, but when it comes to, I think you outlined in your future work the two different models that you'll be um, looking at or, or using to guide your research as you use the CLSA's comprehensive um, data set. But do you have any hypotheses, um, you know, maybe on a smaller scale, maybe if we just think of the, um, the depressed, the, the, the men with stroke who are, who are self the men, men with stroke who, who indicated they slightly maybe depressed or the younger group who um, slightly indicated that depression is, you know, there might be some signs of depression there. Any hypotheses there as to why, you know, that might be happening for those groups? Uh, well, depression is uh, fairly common after stroke, um, so it could be related to the, the stroke. Um, we, we do know that from um, some of the, 
other work that we've that we've done than with the um, this model on the on the left uh, looking at community ambulation and people with with stroke we had um, we had developed a model with structural equation modeling based on data that we had available to us, so secondary data analysis, but then we also interviewed, did focus groups of people with stroke and asked them about barriers and facilitators and, and um, how they felt um, with walking and that sort of out outdoors, that sort of thing. And they told us about how um, mood was very important and that walking may help to increase their mood. And if they had decreased mood, then they might be less likely to walk. But if they did walk, it helped them feel better. So um, there's a there's definitely a, a relationship. We know there's a relationship between depression and exercise. Um, so that, that exercise may help to decrease depression. So um, certainly we see that uh, that relationship there in, in an earlier model that we that we did. So we are expecting that we will see that um, again with our uh, using this other data. Right. I think the 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 question one of the first questions we have from a participant um, relates to that is why were the men with stroke and osteoarthritis less likely to walk outside regardless of nice weather? Um, yeah, that's that, a good that, question. <laughs> that touches on maybe the, the the depression. Maybe that was that was there. Or I'll let you. <laughs> oh yeah. That. Yeah. I mean, that was the other difference with men, um, too, that we saw. So um, I guess that is another uh, question, I guess, the, I guess for any research. But certainly with this, we had um, a lot of interesting answers and then also a few other interesting questions that we need to pursue more in the future. But um, that is an interesting question. I, unfortunately, I don't know the answer uh, to that. <laughs> Oh, you should know. You should have all the answers. <laughs> but I guess that's the beauty of this sort of research. Um, okay, so another question we have is: any consideration to socioeconomic status and the importance of socioeconomic status in health behavior theory, or the, well, the SES differential? We did. We did use um, income as a um, as a control variable. So we did control for that, but we have not investigated that specifically or further. So I think that would be um, a good aspect to study on specifically for a future project. Um, and then we have another question. Um, why are women, I think you might have touched on, oh, maybe not. Why are women less likely than men to actually walk outside? And is this consistent with other studies? Um, we did when we did our um, literature review um, prior to doing the study. We did see some studies that suggested that that women um, could be less likely um, to walk or walk outdoors for exercise, and so we certainly did um, see that um, in some of our uh, results. Although not for uh, not for people with stroke, though. So it seemed like our stroke group was quite different in in a lot of ways, which is interesting. Um, so it it does uh, it does fit with some other literature that we have seen. Um, and next question is, what do you expect to get from the application of the structural equation modeling that is different from the regression analyses that you already did? That's a difficult question. Um, I think it's uh, the with the structural equation modeling, we had done that with a group of people with stroke. Uh, so we also want to identify if that model um, can be verified with people with osteoarthritis as well and with older adults uh, in general. Um, we have most of the variables are available to us that we should be able to replicate uh, replicate the model. So we're hoping we're, we're going to see if there's any any differences to the original model. Um, and uh, I think that's the, the main thing is to really try to um, also expand on the model in a way because the, again, I mentioned we did structural equation modeling and then also spoke to people who had uh, uh, experience with stroke and, and walking outdoors. And so some of the additions to the model 
if you see it on the screen, anything with the dotted lines or things that we added from what people told us. So some of these things that people told us, we do have some variables for that in the CLSA data, and we can also um, add that into the into the model. So hopefully the model will be expanded and, and show us some additional information. So it's it may be a bit uh, maybe a bit different than um, our um, our regression models, although I mean it should it should match. But then in addition, I think it will give us some more information about how things relate together. So I don't think that the variables that are associated with community ambulation aren't going to be different, but we will see how they they fit together in the SCM model. It's always good to use. Uh multiple methods and uh, analyses, which um, I'll ask another question that I had noted as well. So, yep, I'm on mute. Um, yeah, obviously there's lots, of, there's lots of information you can get from the CLSA data and you're involved in this area of research, uh, but you know, do you have any other plans outside of using the CLSA data to complement this work and doing any more qualitative uh, type research? Um, and finding out a little bit more about, you know, the reasons maybe why um, self-rated health is, is is a factor. Um, there's a few other things that you mentioned that I thought could be explored with a complementary qualitative type study. Uh, well, right now, um, as you've mentioned at the beginning, we're uh, doing a study um, called uh, Go Out, which is focusing on um, outdoor walking for older adults. and. Uh, we are looking at, at interventions specifically, focusing on on what barriers that some older adults may have to walking outdoors based on a, a mobility framework by Shumway, uh, Shumway Cook and Patla. And um, with, with that study, we also have, so we'll have all the um, data from our follow-up evaluations after our walking intervention, but we also are incorporating a qualitative component as well. So we will, um, among our qualitative questions are things like barriers and facilitators and, and whether the program is beneficial or not. So a wide range of questions. We're going to have a lot more um, information about um, walking outdoors from that study. So partly from the quantitative, partly from the qualitative. Um, we're also looking at uh, trying to look at some weather issues specifically. So um, we're just starting to do or rather we're just finishing analysis on a study looking at um, participation in activity and people with stroke in different seasons. So uh, people were interviewed in the summer and in the winter talking about barriers and facilitators to participation in activity um, based on, on weather conditions. And so we're just finishing um, analyzing that right now. And uh, we've just put together a, a team to look at at winter walking and issues um, regarding um, outdoor winter walking and, and safety and risk of falls, et cetera, for older adults. And so our team will be meeting soon and discussing what our research priorities will be moving forward. Thanks. Um, so actually, the, the qu last question that was posted relates to whether, um, how are you accounting for climate change affects it, affecting the research? If at all. <laughs> yeah, well, if at all. We haven't um, to date, but that's a really good question because as I was going through this, I, I was I was thinking thinking about that because certainly we are seeing changes in in weather, and that's something that we need to start considering. And and certainly in our in our outdoor walking study during the intervention, it we have held held it in city parks outdoors in summer months. And we and sometimes we have to cancel because of rain or what have you, but we've also had to cancel because of uh, poor weather quality conditions or because there was forest fires in an area nearby and it was too smoky to be safely walking outdoors. So um, we are seeing that the weather changes are are affecting our um, ability to do the research, and that certainly will be affecting our outcomes and ability to walk outdoors. So something we need to be focusing on. In the future, for sure. 
And I'm just going to ask one last question since we have some time, and then uh, perhaps we'll wrap it up after that if we don't get any more. Um, that also speaks to, I think, I was, when I was hearing some of your results, I thought, you know, this would be um, very important information for um, uh, municipal, local decision makers to have, too, in terms of the importance of, of walking um, uh, facilities for older adults. And so have you... Uh, do you have any plans to, and, and I'm also by background a, a knowledge translation researcher, so <laughs> what, like I'm just curious, have you thought of, of um, you know, communicating some of those results to uh, local decision makers, you know, to feed into their processes for developing indoor walking tracks or mm -hmm. um, developing partnerships in, in that respect? Um, that's certainly part of our, our plan with our go out study. My um, co PI is Nancy Solbach at University of Toronto, and so a big um, focus of that of that project is on knowledge translation and being able to, um, of course, depending on our results, incorporate the, the intervention into the community. So that will be a big part of it, and working with different um, community groups. So it could be at a um, say a, a civic level, for example. Uh, and with our, our outdoor walking team that we're developing, um, we do have some members on the team who are um, community members and, uh, and we will be associating with probably um, municipal um, representatives um, as well with results of our research. So I'll just, I'll just turn it back to you finally and just say, was there anything else you wanted to address um, to the group before we, um, I do our closing remarks and we ask participants to complete the, their exit survey? Um, I don't think anything specifically I'd want to add, but just, I guess, to uh, consider in your, in your research or clinical practice the, the importance of, of outdoor walking and any ambulation for your, your client groups. Perfect. Well, thank you again for a great presentation. We appreciate your participation in the CLSA webinar series. I'd like to remind everyone that CLS, the CLSA has data access request applications and that are ongoing. The next deadline for applications is February 12th of 2020. Uh, if you want more information, please visit the CLSA website under the data access under data access to review what data is available um, and any other further information and details about the application process. I'd also like to remind everyone to complete their survey that's located under the polling option. If you don't see it beside the chat button, please click the drop down arrow and I think it was just, uh, it did just pop, should have just popped up. Um, and for our first webinar of 2020, we'll, it will take place on January 29th at noon. Uh, Dr. Sarah Hugo, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Applied Human Sciences at the University of Prince Edward Island, will present uh, her presentation entitled The Early Retiree Divests the Workforce, a Quantitative Analysis of Early Retirement Among Health Professionals Using CLSA Data. And you can register for that uh, starting now. I believe it's open. Um, and uh, finally, graduate students and postdoctoral fellows with an interest in longitudinal studies on aging are encouraged to save the date for our summer program in aging, which is called SPA for short. Uh, this innovative five-day training program will take place next June at the Hockley Valley Resort in southwestern Ontario. More details will be available in January 2020 when the program launches on CIHR's ResearchNet. And also remember, the CLSA promotes this webinar series using the hashtag CLSA webinar. We invite you all to follow us on Twitter at, at CLSA underscore ELCV. And I think those are all the key points. So thank you again to everyone for attending today's presentation and to our speakers. And we'll see you in January.